Thank you. Thank you for that uh, generous introduction, Gonzalo. Um, I'm delighted to hear about the objectives of the institution to um, turn the resources of interdisciplinary work towards important practical topics in the, in the world, and nothing could be more important than climate change. So uh, I hope that I'll be able to contribute a bit to, to that work. Um, I'm going to start um, with a picture. Uh, Hmm. A picture. Um, this is a picture of jubilation. This is the jubilation that took place at um, the meeting of uh, the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change in Paris in 2015. And what these people are celebrating is the signing uh, by almost every country in the world of um, the so-called Paris Agreement, which says, this agreement aims to strengthen the global response to the threat of climate change by holding the increase in the global average temperature to well below two degrees above pre-industrial level and pursuing efforts to limit the temperature increase to 1.5 degrees above pre-industrial levels. That's what the countries agreed, but although they celebrated, they did not mean what they said. In support of the agreement, these countries made pledges to the United Nations to reduce their own emissions, but those pledges taken together are not enough to meet the two degree target, let alone the 1.5 degree uh, target. If all the pledges were fulfilled, there would still be an increase of 2.8 degrees by 2100, by the end of this century, according to the website Climate Action Tracker, which um, uh, investigates these pledges. Moreover, very few of the countries are even on track to meet the pledges that they made. And very, very few have policies that Climate Action Tracker rep reckons are compatible with two degrees uh, of warming. And in fact, apart from a blip in the last year due to, climate, to um, COVID, the world's greenhouse gas emissions are still growing. Uh, the British government, which signed the agreement, is um, one example uh, of what I, what I mean. Um, before the Paris meeting, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change had made it perfectly clear that the two degree target could be met only by the most stringent action to control emissions. Everybody would have to act very strongly in order to control emissions. And yet, within days after agreeing to the Paris Agreement, the UK government drastically cut its subsidy for installing solar panels. It also issued licenses for fracking in many parts of England with the aim of opening up new reserves of fossil fuel. And still within days, it removed the tax advantage it had previously given to low emission cars. So it's obvious that the British government never meant to do as it promised in Paris. And as it's um, the UK's independent climate change committee reminded us recently, the British government likes to make impressive promises about climate change, and it's now puffing itself up as the chair of the next UNFCCC meeting in Glasgow next month, but actually it's not interested in keeping the promises that it makes. Another uh, egregious example of inaction is Australia. Australia has more emissions per capita than even the US, and that's not counting the contribution that Australia makes to climate change by exporting hundreds of millions of tons every year of coal. Uh, 
in the last COP meeting, the UNFCC COP meeting in Madrid in 2019, Australia joined the villains of the meeting, namely the US and Brazil, in various uh, attempts to scupper progress on climate change. At, it had, before that meeting, it had pledged to reduce its emissions to about 20, to between 25 and 28 percent below its 2005 levels by 2030. That was already an extremely modest target. It puts its 2030 emissions above its 1990 emissions, whereas for comparison, the European Union pledged to have its emissions at 40 percent below its 1990 emissions by 2030. So its initial target was extremely modest and in Madrid, Australia announced that it would use something called Kyoto credits to meet about half of its poultry target, um, the target that was poultry in the first place. That was pretty much universally recognized as uh, simple cheating. It was uh, double counting. Um, its reductions in emissions. And moreover, although the Australian government asserts that it's on track to meet its pledges, at a canter as it puts it, there's actually no evidence for this assertion. Australian emissions have been increasing steadily, apart from a blip for COVID, since the present coalition government repealed Australia's carbon tax in 2013. So Australia is doing very badly. And that's striking because Australia is very vulnerable to climate change. Australians live on the habitable fringes of a hot, dry continent, which is expected to become hotter and drier. While the Australian delegates were speaking in Madrid, back home in Australia, their country was on fire. Here is a photo Oh, sorry, I haven't got that far yet. This is the, the graph of emissions, which as you can see is steadily increasing. These are global emissions, steadily increasing up to 2019 and they dropped in 2020 for COVID. This is one of the um, fires uh, in Australia. This particular fire drove 1000 people onto that beach that you see in the foreground where they had to be rescued by the Australian Navy after they'd been there about a week. It was like a wartime e evacuation. And this is just one of many uh, fires. Um, the extent of the Australian fires was stupendous. 18.6 million hectares of Australia burnt during that one fire season. We, many people assume that once things get bad enough, our governments will eventually take action to do something about climate change. But the Australian Prime Minister Scott Morrison showed that that isn't so. During these fires, which were apocalyptic, he said he would not be pushed by environmentalists into making what he called reckless cuts to the coal industry. Uh, the Australian government is still opening vast new coal mines in Queensland and New South Wales. And although Australians, two thirds of Australians, favour a commitment to net zero emissions by 2050, their government still refuses uh, to make it, make that commitment. And it now seems as though their prime minister may not even go to the meeting in Glasgow next month. Why not? Why is this, this total inaction on the part of the Australian government? Well, it's because of the tremendous power of the coal industry in Australia. Coal is the country's second largest export and it directly employs nearly 40,000 people. And this gives it tremendous influence with the government. So I'm reminding you of some depressing facts and um, now I'm going to explain why. The first reason is that I want to make it clear that the international effort to bring climate change under control is failing. You might fairly say even 
but it's failed. It's been in train since at least the Rio Earth Summit in 1992, so we're 30 years down the line, and yet emissions of greenhouse gas continue to grow. The uh, effort um, to control climate change on the part of this United Nations process has rested on an appeal to morality. Because um, of the greenhouse effect, our emissions, the emissions of each one of us, of greenhouse gas, cause harm to other people through global warming. So we, by our acts, um, cause uh, harm. And um, for that reason, um, we should uh, stop doing them. On moral grounds, we should stop doing them because an elementary principle of morality tells us that we should not cause harm to other people and certainly not for our own uh, benefit. That appeal has been made again and again. For example, to take the Stern Review, which was published now 15 years ago, it recommended to the present generation that we should sacrifice a small amount of our own consumption for the sake of bringing a much greater benefit to future people. But why should we do that? Why should we sacrifice our own benefit for the sake of future people? Well, only because of moral responsibility. That was implicitly what Stern was appealing to, our moral responsibility to future generations. Now we have, as a further example, uh, Greta Thunberg making the same moral demand which she does with great force and indignation. She can do that because she is a living representative of the generations that climate change is doing harm to. How dare you, says uh, Greta. You are failing us, but the young people are starting to understand your betrayal. The eyes of all future generations are upon you and if you choose to fail us, I say, we will never forgive you. What she says is right. Climate change is a great moral wrong that's perpetrated by some people on others, in particular by the old upon the young. And the moral appeal to cli against climate change is therefore perfectly justified. Greta's complaint is is absolutely cogent. She's certainly right to make this moral appeal, but I'm sorry to say that it's not proving effective enough to bring climate change under control as the last 30 years have demonstrated to us. Certainly many individuals are moved by morality. Many of the moral philosophers who work on climate change aim to persuade us to lead an environmentally more virtuous life. And many of the people that this um, uh, appeal works, uh, reaches are persuaded by it. Many of us do as they recommend. We're willing to make a sacrifice for the sake of future people. We spend money on insulating our houses, we eat less meat, we reduce our travel and so on. So we do show an individual moral responsibility towards future generations. But individual morality is never going to solve the problem of climate change. And that's just because not enough people will do as morality requires. And also as well as that, reducing our emissions requires more than individual action. We need big changes in our economic infrastructure. And we as individuals are not in a position to make those changes. So to solve the problem of climate change, governments need to act. They can't leave the responsibility for action to individuals. Governments have the coercive power to do what's needed through regulations and taxes. They can make sure that everyone responds to climate change in the way that they need to, not just the few who are morally motivated. But the problem is that many governments are impervious to morality. And that's the second point of the depressing 
facts that I reported to you uh, at the beginning. Um, I told you the, 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 the stories of the British and Australian governments. What we can learn from those is that governments prevaricate. They tell lies, they cheat, they make promises that they do not intend to keep, and they really don't care about the future. It's true that governments are to some extent responsive to the moral motives of their people, but not to a great enough extent. Uh, democratic governments are supposed to be responsive, but even though most Australian people want their government to act on climate change, their government takes no notice of that. It's influenced much more by the coal lobby than by the electorate. And the very largest emitter of all greenhouse gas is China, which is not a democracy at all, and is therefore has no particular responsiveness to its um, uh, people's morality. The great economist um, A.C. Pigou wrote in the 1920s, the state should protect the interests of the future in some degree against the effects of our preference for ourselves over our descendants. It's a clear duty of government, which is the trustee for unborn generations, as well as for its present citizens, to watch over and defend the exhaustible natural resources of the country from rack and rash and reckless spoliation. But actually the boot is on the other foot. It seems to be governments that don't care about unborn generations, even when their citizens do. Instead, governments are motivated to a large extent by the great power of the fossil fuel interests. In fact, so long as there are powerful interests opposed to controlling climate change, governments will not act as they should. Morality will never motivate them. So the only way we can achieve a satisfactory outcome is to make sure it's in no one's interest to oppose action. This is what we should uh, aim for. This is what, where I think international policy should um, now be uh, directed. We should not continue to ask people to sacrifice their interests for moral reasons. If we do not, we can then harness the strong motive of self-interest to drive action on climate change. And this can be done. Climate change can be controlled in a way that requires nobody to make any sacrifice of her own interest. And that includes the owners of fossil fuel resources and the workers in coal mines. None of them need suffer in the with uh, in achieving the aim of controlling climate change to many people that comes as, as a surprise the moral approach has been pursued for so long um, in the uh, international work on climate change that we're used to assuming that the current generation has to make a sacred sacrifice for the sake of the future. But that's not so. Controlling climate change is, will be, if it's done, immensely beneficial. There's so much benefit to be obtained by doing it that that benefit can be shared around everyone. All that is required that it should be distributed correctly between the generations and between the people within the generations. Suppose we did make a sacrifice of our present consumption for the sake of cleaning up the air, then the natural recipients of that benefit would be the future generations. But we can transfer some of that benefit that comes to the future generations back to us in the present, and we can transfer enough to um, leave us as well off as we were before. In effect, future generations can pay for the cleanup that the present generations do by means of a transfer from the future back to the present, uh, 
they can be compensated, they can be fully compensated for their effort and the future generations can end up uh, better off. That's, um, that's a fact. How do I know it? Well, it comes from elementary economic theory. Greenhouse gas is what economists call an externality. When you do something that causes an emission of greenhouse gas, the gas spreads around the world and it does harm everywhere over a very long stretch of time. So it's doing harm to very many people and all that harm is part of the cost of your emission of greenhouse gas, but you don't bear that cost. It's what's called an external cost. It's borne by all the people who suffer the harm and not by the person who is doing the emissions in the first place. So that people do not bear the full cost of their own activity. And they take that in, do not take that into account, the full cost into account when they decide what to do. And the consequence is a sort of inefficiency within the uh, global economy. According to the standard economic theory of externalities, it's what's called a Pareto inefficiency. It's um, uh, a Pareto inefficiency is, is defined, a situation is defined to be Pareto inefficient. If it's possible in principle to change things within the economy so that at least one person ends up better off and no one ends up worse off. And according to standard economic theory, an externality, any externality such as greenhouse gas, normally makes our, position, our situation Pareto inefficient, which means it's possible to respond to the externality, in this case, climate change, in a way that makes at least one person better off without making anyone else, anyone worse off. That's to say, no sacrifice is required. That's the standard theory and it's very straightforward uh, elementary economics and it tells us what we want that no sacrifice is required. However, I have to say that the standard economic theory does not apply to climate change. It doesn't apply to intergenerational externalities such as greenhouse gas which deliver harm to future generations. Because the harm, some of it, falls on future generations, the theory, I'm sorry to say, is invalid. And it's actually not necessarily true that intergenerational externalities normally lead to Pareto inefficiency. And the reason for that is what philo philosophers call the non-identity effect. Whatever we do about climate change will alter the makeup and probably the size of the world's future population. If our government takes any serious action on climate change, they will alter the way we live our lives. For example, they will make it harder to travel. This will alter the structure or the nature of society. People will live more locally. They will, society will not be so global. People will meet different people. They will have babies with different people and they will have babies at different times. And some of them will have different numbers of babies. And the result is that the next generation will be made up of different people and different numbers of people from those it would have been made up, up of had our governments done nothing about climate change. That's the non-identity effect. Action on climate change will change the identity and also the numbers of the people in future generations. And the standard economic theory that I told you about applies only if the population is fixed and the people in the population is fixed in numbers and, the, and actually fixed uh, identical people. To see why the theory changes, uh, fails, we can let me take an exaggerated example. Suppose that for some reason or other, the government's climate change policy causes the creation of people who are um, the birth of people who are congenitally unable to enjoy a good life or, or more people who are unable to enjoy a good life. Oh, For example, excuse me, John, sorry to interrupt, but uh, we are not seeing your screen. Are you showing the screen? No, 
No, oh, okay. thank you very much Sorry. for asking. You can see Sorry. I decided you don't need to see my screen anymore. You've just got to look at my face. Forgive me. Okay, fine. I was um, doing that. I, I only wanted to illustrate things with it. Otherwise, I'm doing it all, all by voice. I'm sorry about that. Perfect. Um, well, for example, suppose there's more inbreeding because people don't travel so much. Then there will be more um, people con congenitally unable to lead a good life. And the policy, whatever the policy is, it will not be able to ensure that future generations are better off than they would have been. So the standard economic theory needs to be repaired. And it can be. We need to adopt a different notion of efficiency. It's got to be one that's not based on the well-being of future people, but on the resources that are uh, available to, it, to them. We have to go resources, as you might say. Resourcism is uh, a, a well-known idea within political philosophy. Don't care about the well-being of people, instead care about the resources that people have available to achieve well-being themselves. And we can say that a situation is inefficient if it's possible to change things in the economy so that some existing people are better off, no existing people are worse off, and the resources that are left to future people are at least as good as they were before. So we do not reduce the resources or damage the resources that are left to future people. I call this a new, a new no notion, resource-constrained efficiency, and it can be demonstrated that externalities, including climate change and other intergenerational externalities, cause inefficiency in that sense. And that means that climate change can, in principle, be controlled in a way that makes no presently living person worse off, leaves future generations with just as good resources as they would have had. Um, and in that sense, responding to climate change requires no sacrifice. And later, I shall explain in a little, give a little bit more practical detail about how in practice we could achieve that aim. So I think that our approach to climate change policy should be constrained by the condition that it requires no sacrifice. And no sacrifice constraint should be imposed, I think. Since controlling climate change will generate a huge amount of benefit, this constraint still leaves some choices. It still will be possible to distribute the benefit to make present people better off, or alternatively, to give better resources to future people. So um, distribution can still be chosen between present and future generations. There will be freedom in choosing di distribution, even though nobody accepts uh, any, sa any sacrifice. But despite that possibility of choosing distribution, there are two strong objections to adopting the no sacrifice constraint. And I shall now talk about those objections and try and respond to them. The first objection is that this constraint will lead the world with economic maldistribution. And the second one is that it will perpetuate injustice in the world. So there's a maldistribution objection and an injustice objection. And I'll explain those and respond to them each in turn. Maldistribution objection first. It's natural to think that our policy on climate change should aim at achieving the best possible result. And the best possible result implies uh, achieving the best possible distribution of wealth and income, both within generations and between generations. But the no sacrifice constraint is going to prevent us from achieving the very best result. Without that constraint, we could do better. Otherwise, it wouldn't be a constraint. Just because it's a constraint, it's going to prevent us from achieving the very best distribution of resources between the uh, generations. So some maldistribution is implied, therefore, by um, the no sacrifice constraint. To respond to that, I'm going to do it in two steps, because there are two sorts of maldistribution to worry about the intergenerational maldistribution and the intragenerational maldistribution. And I'll start with 
the intergenerational maldistribution. Several economists have done detailed calculations about how much effort should go into dealing with climate change if we aim for the best result overall. And their general conclusion, the almost universal conclusion, is that the best result overall implies the present generations making a sacrifice. So the best intergenerational distribution implies some transfer of resources from the present generation to the future generation. So the no sacrifice constraint is going to prevent us from achieving that best intergenerational distribution. But that's where we started, remember. For over 30 years, we've been urging the present generation to make a sacrifice for the sake of the future. And our economic models emphasize that this is the best thing to do. But that's an appeal to the present generation's morality and it's failed. The present generation as represented by our governments will not make that sacrifice. And that's why I recommend a different approach. We have to accept that it will not lead to the best intergenerational distribution. What about intragenerational distribution? The world as we have it is grossly unequal and that's plainly a very bad thing. So if we choose our climate change policy with the aim of producing the best results, this will be a policy that involves some dis redistribution from better off to worse off people within the present distribution within the present generation, because the present just distribution of well-being and wealth is grossly unequal and grossly bad on that account. But imposing the no sacrifice constraint will prevent that distribution between people within the present generation. So the just distribution will end up worse than it would have been without that constraint. But again, that can't be helped since the present uh, better off people will not accept a sacrifice. The world is beset by many problems. Climate change is one of them. Inequality within the world is another one. And those problems don't have to be solved together. We should not saddle our response to climate change with the additional task of correcting the world's inequality. If we do, I'm sure we shall end up with no successful response to either of the two problems. If climate change were an important cause of the world's inequality, I uh, might be right to tackle the two problems together, but it's not. The world's inequality results from centuries of unequal development and from centuries of colonialism too. Climate change is too recent to have made much difference to global inequality. Though it is true that it's now exacerbating inequality, it's not had time to make a huge difference. So I think we should not saddle our climate change problem with the problem of improve, improving inequality within the world at the present. In some, I think that mal, the maldistribution problem is serious and bad, um, uh, but it's forced on us by the failure of the appeal to morality, we cannot take on improving maldistribution at the same time as we try to deal with climate change. That's a maldistribution objection. Now the climate change, I'm sorry, the injustice uh, objection. When you harm another person, you do her an injustice unless there's some, some exculpating circumstance, unless you do it in self-defense, uh, for example, or with, with her consent. Our emissions of greenhouse gas harm other people and there are no exculpating circumstances. So our emissions are unjust. And if we adopt a no sacrifice response to climate change, we don't do anything to overcome this injustice. That's the injustice objection. And it's a correct objection. Take um, uh, um, the injustice of slave ownership for comparison. A slave owner 
obviously inflicts injustice on her slaves. Now, suppose she releases her slaves and is paid full compensation for doing so by the government, shall we say. The slaves are free, so they're better off. And the slave owner is no worse off because she's been fully compensated by for releasing her slaves. So there's been no sacrifice. This is a no sacrifice solution. But the injustice has not been overcome. The slave owner was in, a, in an unjust position of advantage over her slaves. And all the payment has done is perpetuate her unjust advantage. She ends up in an unjustly advantageous position because she's compensated for releasing her slaves. And the no sacrifice cons constraint on climate change action is parallel. Those who emit greenhouse gas unjustly advantage themselves by their emissions, inflicting harm on other people. Under a no sacrifice policy, they are paid enough to make it worth their while to stop their emissions. So their unjust advantage is perpetuated, just as the slave owner's advantage is perpetuated. Now, among those people who will be compensated, many um, do it um, unknowingly, but some do it knowingly and do it on a very large scale and do everything they can to continue the harm that they do. I'm thinking of the leaders of the fossil fuel industry. Several of those people are bad people. They tell lies about climate change and they pay others to tell lies in order to preserve their unjust advantage. The Koch family, for instance, in the States, uh, owners of a giant fossil fuel company, and up to 2018, they spent $168 million funding groups that engage in climate denial. Justice would require people like this to be punished for their injustice, but under a no sacrifice policy, they will not be punished, they will be rewarded. And that is part of the injustice objection. And I must say, I find this the worst feature of a no sacrifice policy. It's, it sticks in the gullet, but I think we have to swallow this bitter pill. These people have the power to prevent us from controlling climate change, as is shown in Australia. The fossil fuel interests were able to persuade the Australian government to remain inactive about climate change. These people hold us to ransom, as you might say. And I'm sorry to say we have to pay the ransom they demand. We have to buy out the fossil fuel interests if we are to deal with uh, climate change. Now, more practical question. I claimed on purely theoretical grounds that a no, no sacrifice policy is possible. But you might reasonably wonder how. I said that since the benefits of controlling climate change naturally accrue to future generations, a no sacrifice policy will involve transferring benefits back from the future generations to presently living people. And you might wonder, how can that be done? How can benefits be transferred backwards in time? Well, the answer to that is actually quite simple. Um, we don't exactly transfer benefits backwards. What we do is we fail to transfer benefits forwards. We of the present generation control the resources that will be available to future people. We consume some of those resources and we pass the rest along to them. And if we choose, we can simply hold back some of rather more of the resources for ourselves. So that's the way on the, on the sort of gross macroeconomic scale, this transfer can be managed. How can it be managed in practice? Well, first of all, we need a reasonably efficient economy. And any economist knows that when we're dealing with an externality, such as greenhouse gas, we can't uh, possibly achieve efficiency unless the external, externality is internalized, as the economists say. Um, an emission of greenhouse gas has an external cost, 
and the emitter needs to take that in external cost into account. How is that to be achieved? It's to be achieved by making sure that she actually has to pay that internal, that external cost herself. It has to be brought home to, to her, and that means there has to be a carbon price that she has to pay, and the carbon price has to be equal to the external cost. So we need a carbon price. That can be achieved in various ways, but one the simplest way is by means of a, of a carbon tax. The carbon tax provides an incentive for consumers to shift their consumption towards carbon, less carbon intensive goods. And if the tax is right, it will move us towards an efficient uh, economy. Those who, um, but that doesn't achieve uh, no sacrifice. It doesn't mean making everyone better off because the tax will hurt the people who emit a lot of carbon dioxide, such as the owners of um, coal mines. It'll benefit many people by making the air cleaner, but it would also hurt quite a lot of people. So if no one is to make a sacrifice, as I propose, then there will need to be a transfer of resources from future people to the, those who make the sacrifice in the present. And it's got to be sufficient to compensate present people for the cost of paying the carbon tax. So that requires a sort of redistribu redistributive taxation. Governments will need to tax future people in order to pay present people um, compensation for the sacrifices that they need to make. So how does the government tax future people? Well, by borrowing, by public borrowing. Government debt is in effect a commitment to tax people in the future in order to repay the debt. So government can sell this commitment, the commitment to tax future people in the form of government bonds, and then it can use the revenue it raises to compensate present people to the extent of making them no worse off than they were before. Um, so that's the basic mechanism. Borrowing is in a way of shifting the burden towards the future um, people um, and uh, transferring resources back to um, uh, present people. How can it actually do the compensation? Well, for most people, it can do it by reducing their other taxes. And that is plainly what a government needs to do when it imposes a carbon tax. It should reduce other taxes, particularly income tax. And it should be able to reduce those sufficiently to compensate people for paying the carbon tax. We need a shift in the nature of taxation rather than a net increase uh, in taxation. Um, the more will be required for the owners of fossil fuel resources. They will have to be bought out and that will require, will have to be paid for. That, that um, will have to be paid for out of the uh, public loans uh, as well. You might ask how the financial process of borrowing and spending, which is merely a financial operation, moves real resources from future people back to present people. Well, the answer to that is that it does it by the working of the market. Present people will spend their extra income on present consumption, and that will di divert resources away from conventional investment. So fewer resources will go through to future people. So they will receive less from us than they otherwise would have done. They will uh, receive a net reduction. Uh, they will receive a reduction not um, uh, a, a reduction so much that it cancels out the benefit they receive from cleaner air, but they will receive a reduction in their other resources. And um, that will be what covers the present people for compensation for paying the carbon tax. So this no sacrifice policy will need to be achieved by government borrowing. Now that brings us, gives us a new problem. The, um, the no sacrifice approach to dealing with climate change will require a new era of increasing public debt. And there are two difficulties with this. Um, some governments are not credit worthy enough to borrow. So they will not be able to increase their public debt. And even the governments that are able to borrow show a great or have shown in the past a great reluctance to do so, public debt has a bad name in many countries. 
and this is exhibited by European countries who have been imposing austerity on their people for the last decade, um, even though they could instead have borrowed at negligible interest rates and using the, um, borrow, the, using the sums they borrow to invest very heavily in reducing climate change. But they've refused to do that. On grounds of fiscal probity, they've refused to borrow to the extent that they easily could have borrowed. That fiscal probity has now been blown away by COVID. In the last uh, year or so, governments have been spending huge amounts of money on fighting uh, the virus, and they've been willing to accept soaring public debt. So I'm hoping that this urgent health crisis has shown the governments that they can do it. You can borrow if you've got an emergency to deal with, and it doesn't do any harm. The public debt is not doing them any harm. Um, and they should learn that with the much greater emergency of climate change, they can tackle it by the same expedient of increasing public um, borrowing. Let's hope that that, that that happens. But even if it does happen among the rich countries, there is a second problem that the poor countries cannot raise credit in any case. And to deal with that, we need a new financial institution. They call it a World Climate Bank, and it's modeled on the idea of the existing World Bank. The World Bank was founded after the Second World War with the aim of financing the world's recovery from the uh, devastation of the war. And it financed it by borrowing, by public borrowing. The World, ba climate, the world Bank is guaranteed, its debts are guaranteed by the rich countries, and that means it's able to borrow, and it can pass the, um, its borrowing onto the countries that needed, that were poor and needed finance for reconstructing themselves. We could do the same if we created a world, um, a world climate bank. Its remit would be to borrow using the financial stability and economic stability of the rich countries who would be members of it, and passing loans onto the poor countries who otherwise would not be able to borrow. And that way, all the world would be able to undertake the investment that's needed to control climate change. And Mr. Broome, sorry. Yes. For much of time, we need to start yes. concluding your talk, please. I, I've just finished. Okay. And in fact, I'm going to put up, if I can manage to do it, my um, my ending slide. Um, there. The end. <laughs> Excellent. This is another Australian fire. This is the sort of thing that there was all over Australia. Um, okay, yes, I'm sorry, I went on a bit longer than 40 minutes. It's all right. Thank you very much, Professor Broom, for this really interesting talk. Um, it's been really inspiring um, hearing to you today. Um, now I'm, I would like to pass um, um, the word to Sasha, who will comment on your talk. Please, Sasha. Thank you so much, John, for a, a truly excellent talk. In your discussion, you present a diagnosis of our global failure to take meaningful action to mitigate climate change, and you propose a shift in strategy designed to help us overcome our current impasse. You then want to offer a practical proposal guided by the spirit of this new strategy, discussing various objections to it, which you seem to believe can be overcome. So you first draw our attention to the fact that international efforts to get world governments to act meaningfully on climate change have failed and are currently failing. You then offer a causal diagnosis of this failure, suggesting that these efforts have been unsuccessful in large part because they rest on a moral appeal. You go on to claim that governments will not be moved to act on the basis of such an appeal. And from these premises, you draw on my reading two conclusions. First, that we ought to abandon moral appeals to self-sacrifice in our efforts to bring about meaningful governmental action on climate change. 
And second, that we should instead focus our efforts on creating a world in which it is in no one's self-interest to oppose action to mitigate climate change. You write, quote, we should not ask anyone to sacrifice her interest for moral reasons. We can then harness the strong motive of self-interest to drive action on climate change, and this can be done. Climate change can be controlled in a way that requires no one to make a sacrifice, not even the owners of fossil fuel resources and workers in coal mines, none of them need suffer." End quote. So I find this to be an immensely powerful, intriguing, and in the end, hopeful argument. And I would just like to explore it in my brief comments by putting pressure on each of its parts. I'll then turn briefly to the practical deal details of your proposal. So let me begin with some thoughts about the premises that figure in the early part of your argument. First, I turn to your claim that efforts to bring about meaningful government action have failed, largely because they are based on a moral appeal that casts self-sacrifice as crucial to turning the tide on the problem. So while I agree that this appeal has figured strongly in international efforts to drum up the necessary political will to deal with the crisis, I find the root cause of our collective failure to be less clear. It seems to me that many governments now appreciate quite profoundly, perhaps more profoundly than ever before, that their short and midterm self-interest, both economic and otherwise, is gravely threatened by unmitigated climate change. Nevertheless, these threats to national self-interest have also, so far, proven insufficient to bring about the scale of political action that is needed. If this is the case, then the picture you suggest in which governments never or very rarely act out of moral interest, but can be relied upon to act out of self-interest of some kind, seems perhaps a bit oversimplified and not quite right. At a minimum, I would suggest that the reasons for our failure to bring about meaningful governmental action on the climate are overdetermined. And in light of this, I would suggest we shouldn't be too quick to discard the moral language we naturally use to frame the issue on the assumption that moral pleas will never be enough under any circumstance to move the political needle. Indeed, one might argue that abolitionism, understood as a predominantly moral movement appealing to moral motives, eventually succeeded in reshaping the US political economic order in a radical way. It took roughly 200 years, of course, from the inception of this movement to the full legal emancipation of slaves, at least in the United States. Slavery was finally outlawed in 1865. And while the political dynamics fueling the abolitionist movement and uh, the precise role it played in bringing about the eventual end of legal slavery are subject to dispute, I think it's not implausible to see this case as presenting a compelling counterexample to your claim that governments will never be sufficiently moved to act on the basis of moral considerations. So we, of course, are only 30 or 40 years into the moral argument on climate change. And just because we have not yet seen the political progress we need and had hoped for does not, on my view, give us grounds to conclude that the moral strategy in all its various forms is necessarily doomed to failure. On the other hand, strategies for climate action rooted primarily in moral considerations certainly bring no guarantee of success, and we do not unfortunately have the luxury of time on our side. In other words, even if one comes to a rosier view than you do, about the possible role of moral considerations in motivating government action, a case might still be made to the effect that we simply cannot afford to keep hammering away at the same rhetorical strategy we've used for the past 40 years, given how slow our progress has been up to this point and given how dire the stakes. So on the basis of these considerations, it certainly seems as though we have urgent reason to broaden and diversify our toolkit. Another reason we might not want to be too hasty in abandoning the moral appeal is that in order to harness the motive of self-interest to drive action on climate change in the way you suggest, uh, 
we need to make a number of changes and investments first, as you point out. For as it currently stands, the strong motive of self-interest drives resistance to meaningful action on climate uh, on the part of the fossil fuel industry and government actors. What motive then are we to rely upon in bringing about the changes that would eventually make possible a politics of climate mitigation, of climate change mitigation that appeals largely or even exclusively to self-interest? Constructing this no sacrifice world, which might need to include something like a world climate bank, will obviously require concerted coordinated effort that may not serve any one nation's competitive economic or political advantage. How then are we to motivate governments to make the necessary sacrifices on the path to this promised no sacrifice future? However we answer these complex questions, I think the case of the abolitionist movement illustrates that it may not be prudent to rule out a priori the appeal to moral considerations, moral considerations which continue to move many people, um, especially in light of the fact that at other times and in other places, such appeals seem to have been instrumental in driving serious social and political change. Lastly, I think we may want to draw some cautionary lessons from these invisible hand style arguments that have inspired in one way or another neoclassical capitalist economics. This seductive hope that we can skip all the hard work of morality, including the sacrifice, while yet still achieving collective morally desirable ends through coordinating the pursuit of individual private interest has been of course central to laissez-faire economics, which has certainly played its part in creating our present predicament. So in light of this, I would caution that the costs of abandoning the moral framing of our collective life in favor of an approach that centers and valorizes private interest should not be underestimated. Now, in order to make headway with these objections, and, and perhaps they can be met, we would likely need a more fine-grained analysis of what so far we have lumped together under this idea of the moral appeal and what exactly it would mean to shift away from it. Um, but this isn't a point that I want to dwell on further now. Instead, I want to turn to the conclusion of your argument, which I find extremely interesting, hopeful, and ambitious. So you argue that, quote, climate change can in principle be controlled in a way that makes no presently living person worse off and leaves future generations with just as good resources as they would have had. In this sense, responding to climate change requires no sacrifice. So taking this claim together with your earlier premises, you argue that our approach to climate change policy should be constrained by the condition that it requires no sacrifice. Um, now the objections that I would like to press against your no sacrifice solution or suggestion build on the objections that you yourself explore in the paper. So let me begin by mentioning them very briefly. Um, you, you, you write that adopting the no sacrifice constraint or a policy that, that adheres to it will leave the world with economic maldistribution and will perpetuate injustice. So in response to the maldistribution objection, you write, quote, the world is beset by many problems, climate change is one, inequality another. These problems do not all have to be solved together. We should not saddle our response to climate change with the additional task of correcting inequality. If we do, we shall end up with no successful response to either. And with respect to the injustice objection, you adopt a similarly pragmatic attitude. In, in effect, yes, those who emit greenhouse gas unjustly advantage themselves by their emissions, inflicting harm on others. And under a no sacrifice policy, these people are not going to be punished. In fact, they will be rewarded. And this is an outcome you lament, but the suggestion is just, look, we have to buck up and deal with it. If the fossil fuel industry is holding us all to ransom, then the sorry truth is just that we have to buy them out. So I admire the, pragmat the pragmatism of these responses, um, of your responses to both these objections, but I worry that the politics of selling a strategy with these consequences in the current and foreseeable political climate um, are not very promising. After all, a brilliant solution to our climate nightmare that cannot gain political traction will not get implemented. So in a nutshell, my concern is that tactics that entrench or augment existing inequalities in wealth and power 
may easily be taken to signal contempt and hostility for the working class. And this may make the present proposal a hard sell in light of rising populist movements that are destabilizing rich and medium income democracies the world over. Moreover, if we can pull off the spectacular feat of significantly mitigating climate change while leaving no one worse off, this does not guarantee that people will perceive this no sacrifice world as one that aligns with their self-interest. Here, I worry that the perception of self-interest and its importance for politics threatens to mess up our tidy cost benefit uh, calculations. More specifically, not being made any worse off may not be felt to align with the interests of billions of people whose expectation is to be able to join the middle class through attaining the levels of consumption that those of us in developed countries have enjoyed for a century or more levels of consumption that are squarely to blame for uh, the crisis we find ourselves in. So even if a no sacrifice future in which climate change is well controlled is possible on paper, my worry is that what we actually require is a world in which people's subjectively perceived self-interest aligns with this envisioned no sacrifice arrangement. And how this alignment is to be brought about on a global scale strikes me as a daunting challenge. So I would love to hear your thoughts on that point. And I will just, I have just one final comment. Um, I find the beauty of borrowing our way out of this mess in the manner you propose really, really quite stunning. It seems to reinforce Adam Tooze's recent analysis of the wild borrowing spree prompted by the coronavirus pandemic, from which he draws this uh, a lesson that is well captured in John Maynard Keynes's memorable phrase that, quote, anything we can actually do, we can afford, end quote. This is John Maynard Keynes uh, during the Second World War. So let us suppose then that the political will to take on immense public debt as a means to mitigating the climate crisis can be found. There is still a question about whether all the money in the world can actually buy the solutions we need on the scale we need them. So according to this worry, the problem would not be that we are running up against a fiscal limit or a political one, but instead eh, against the hard and obdurate limits of human action in the world as we find it. So to quote Keynes again, anything we can actually do, we can afford, end quote. This may be true, but then we have to ask ourselves whether it is, as a matter of fact, possible while respecting the no sacrifice constraint to get down to net zero before we set ourselves irreversibly on the path of a two degree or worse temperature rise. And here I think the skeptic's position is very well captured by George Monbiot's recent column in The Guardian, which was entitled, Green Growth Does Not Exist, less of everything is the only way to avert catastrophe, end quote. So I close by inviting you to say a bit more about these sorts of objections. My aim, of course, has not at all been to, raid, to rain on your no sacrifice parade. The approach strikes me as ingenious and extremely hopeful, but the worry is that uh, such a no sacrifice future may just be too good to be true. Thank you, thank you, John. Thank you very much, Sasha. It's been really interesting comments. Um, so before um, asking Professor Broom to answer to the um, Sasha's comments, I would like to open the conversation and give and receive some some questions from you guys. Uh, there might be one or two. Yes, Ross Mitiga. Uh, hi, thank you. Um, uh, thanks, John, for, for the excellent talk. Uh, thanks, Sasha, for, for the great comments uh, to kick off the discussion. Um, uh, John, I, I always deeply admire your work, enjoy hearing your talks. Uh, I do have some doubts about the, 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 cap the capacities of loans to buy us out of the situation to create kind of no sacrifice policy. I, I think I expressed some of these hesitations to you last year. Uh, 
But I've, I've heard it argued quite compellingly before that any, any kind of public, massive public borrowing, of course, is not borrowing from the future, even if it effectively amounts to that. It's, it's, borrow, it's shifting resources within this generation from the rich to the poor. And so I wonder, as you, as you indicated, I think rightly, we, we might expect some real public, we might expect some real resistance to a massive debt program among the world's governments. Why should we push for that solution uh, if, if governments are going to resist uh, rather than uh, 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 just a pure redistribution program that, that accomplishes the same thing? Um, second question I had for you uh, concerns the buyout, uh, the buyout idea. And I wonder here if you think that something like Jerry Cohen's critique of Rawls's difference principle applies in the same case. Uh, you know, uh, Cohen was famously worried that uh, the, the powerful people might, uh, in effect, keep, uh, hold society hostage by saying, you know, we, we, we need a greater share of the distribution uh, uh, if we're going to share our talents with the rest and so on. Um, my thought here is that if we enter into this idea of uh, we're going to just buy out the bad actors, who's going to decide what the buyout price is? And why would that one-time buyout be more attractive to the relevant actors than the capacity to continue extract, to, continue to extract resources? And, and I wonder if we have to kind of muster a real public energy campaign to force the government to force these bad actors to accept this one-time payout and, and kind of shut the door on their industry. Uh, uh, first of all, why would we not, why wouldn't it be a better investment of our time and energy to pressure the government into simply nationalizing those industries and managing the decline? And uh, uh, I guess on the, 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 yeah, I think I think I'll, I think I'll, I think I'll leave it there. What, why would we? Why shouldn't we just push the government to, to act in that more aggressive way rather than just to simply buy out these bad actors? And and don't you worry at all? And I think this picks up on Sha Sasha's comment uh, that if we were to succeed in forcing the government to force the bad actors to accept a one-time buyout, that there wouldn't be a really terrible kind of public backlash. Uh, and I'm thinking here about uh, you know in the 2008 financial collapse. The uh, many world governments moved quickly to shore up the economic industry, which was perceived as, as governments rewarding those responsible for the financial crash. And this, this, I think, really fed into the destabilization, polarization of politics in the contemporary moment. Do you not worry that something similar might happen if we went for a fossil fuel buyout? Thanks. I, I know there's a number of questions there, so I'll leave it. All right. Professor Ross, um, I will accept two more questions and then I will leave it to respond, please. Um, so I have Pablo Marquette and Luis Fuentes. Um, hi, everyone. Um, Professor Brom, uh, thank you for your talk and thank you to the other commentators and, and people here making questions. Very, very interesting reflection. And uh, I really like your idea of a World Climate Bank. I think it's um, in general a, a great way forward because we are going to need of uh, international resources to make adjustment. But this, uh, what worries me is that it's still a bank. And when you loan money and when you borrow money, uh, usually associated to those uh, borrowings, there are uh, discount rates in terms of uh, what you have to pay and discount for future generations. So in fact, you are discounting the value of, of future life. And uh, let me quote a, a friend, a good friend of, of, of Keynes, who was Frank Ramsey, who actually wrote this wonderful essay on the theory of savings and said that uh, he, because Keynes actually asked him uh, that his theory was wrong because he wasn't including a discount rate. And, and Ramsey said, I'm not because it is unjust to discount future lives. So I would like to hear your comments on that and see how this discount rate actually fits into your, your, uh, your argument for um, uh, borrowing and actually uh, uh, no sacrifice policy. Thank you. Thank you, Pablo. Luis? Well, I really, I really did. Thanks. And uh, yeah, great to hear the, the, this talk. Uh, 
uh, your your approach is very pragmatic and 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 leaves all all notions of justice, especially with the with the the future generations that will either have to uh, um, suffer the brunt of climate change or pay the debt. I mean, okay, but that's one thing that is, I, I leave this kind of ethic judge judgment out, but. But in the practical side, how are you going to convince the wealthy countries to put money in this bank? Because um, actually, they haven't put any money in, in or, or very few money on the on the adaptation fund that was agreed on on Paris. Uh, they also haven't haven't uh, they, they haven't showed this this uh, this intention, and um, and and is people is current people really not going to suffer uh, the effects of this increased debt because there will be less resources available for our things i mean uh, it's not exactly the same if you live in a world with a huge uh, with a, with the world bank with two world banks um okay that that that's it thank you very much thank you luis so Please, Professor Broom, if you can answer the questions on the Sasha's comments, uh, that, would be, that would be great. Thank you. Um, be before I start there, can you give me an idea of, of time? How, how long is this session Still have, aimed to um, last for? 15 minutes left, no more than that. So 15. 15 <laughs> Okay. Well, I'll try and, try and apportion my time. Because those are all... Um, important comments that, that um, are not easy to answer very quickly. So I'll do, do, my, do my best. Um, the first thing, and I'll take them in order, so, so Sasha first. Um, as you started talking, Sasha, I realized that I presented things in um, a way that was not quite as I intended. So I talked a lot, a lot about what we should do. And what I said was that we should um, except the no sacrifice constraint on uh, future uh, on um, climate policy. Now the we there was a rather grand sort of we. What I was referring to was the international process of negotiation. I wasn't talking about what we as individuals should aim at. So I certainly didn't want to suggest that um, the, the, the philosophers and others who are arguing that we ought to make a, um, a, compl uh, a sacrifice should cease their work. I do think that we as individuals ought to make a sacrifice, and I think it's correct for people to say that. Um, but I don't think that that's the way of thinking that should regulate the international negotiations that take place at the COP meetings. What the COP should be aiming at is the no sacrifice policy. And I say that because I think I, I want it to direct its efforts towards something which I think might be, might be pra practically successful, which is creating a world climate bank. I think that the economists and the other people involved in the COP process should see this question of finance, they now talk about it as finance, as the crucial issue. And in particular, they should make it possible to raise money by loans to deal with climate change. So I certainly didn't want to suggest that um, the uh, that morality has become redundant in this, um, in this argument. And I do think that everybody who says we should make a sacrifice is telling the truth. And that will be practically important because one thing that Sasha brought up was the free rider problem. I, I think there are really two, two, two sorts of problems that face us when we're negotiating and trying to sort out a, an international policy about climate change. One I did talk about <coughs> which is that it's very hard to get people um, in any generation to make a, a, the present generation to make a sacrifice. The other is that, um, is that um, climate change is a commons problem, which means that it's not in the interest of any individual government, even 
I would think China, although um, China is nearest to it, it's not in the interest of any individual government to have a policy against climate change because the emissions of any nation, particular nation, um, uh, cause harm, but mostly to other, other nations, not to itself. Um, you know, if Britain, for example, increases its emissions or continues emitting, if Britons, individual Britons, are not much harmed by that. It's everybody in the whole world who's harmed by that, and the Brit British receive rather little of Britain's um, uh, emissions. Um, and that's why um, it's in, although it is in the interest, this is what I've been arguing, it is in the interests of every country, every individual and every country to reduce emissions. It's still, um, in order to achieve that result, it has to be achieved by cooperation between the nations, because there is always a temptation for nations not to participate in this, to break out, become free riders and not um, uh, reduce their own emissions. And I think that we need some, some um, moral constraint against being a free rider to um, overcome the free rider problem. And I didn't talk about that and I'm, and I'm glad that you uh, brought it up. Um, you mentioned the difficulty of politics in the present world, the present populist policy. Um, now, I must say that my understanding of pop the populism that we have in most of the world is that it's um, not in favor of controlling climate change and it's not particularly opposed to the owners of fossil fuels. One of the great um, uh, achievements of populist governments is that um, the aspiring poor who would like to become rich are persuaded to vote in favor of the people who are already rich, some of them uh, uh, rich as a result of um, uh, climate change uh, emissions. And I don't think that um, uh, I, I don't think that in some way or other these populist movements would find themselves opposed to an idea that we should promote individual self-interest. It seems to me that's exactly what they, what they are uh, aiming at. Um, the example of slavery, I, it is a good example, but um, there is a difference between the present case and the two differences I see between the present case and the case of slavery. Um, one was one you mentioned yourself, it took an awful long time for the, I do agree that the moral appeal in the end is what overcame slavery. It took an awful long time and we don't have that much time in the case of uh, climate change. We really need to act very uh, urgently. Um, and the other thing is that the um, interests, the, the people who, who, who benefited from slavery were in a small minority, whereas the people who benefit from climate change emissions in the rich countries is pretty much everybody. We all benefit from our emissions of climate change. So there's a, um, it's, it's a much br broader um, interest that needs to be overcome if we are going to achieve the result by overcoming interests. Um, gosh, I'm sorry, I'm get, I think there's one more thing that I wanted to say about Sasha. Maybe I'll come back to that, I'd better, I'd better say, uh, respond to 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 Ross. Um, uh, yes, um, this is something that I glossed over. As Ross pointed out, you don't borrow from future people. When governments borrow, they borrow from present people. And when they repay their debts, they repay their debts. And if they do it in the future, they repay their debts to future people. So this is not, public borrowing is not borrowing from the future. It's borrowing. How it works is this, it borrows from present capitalists. Now those present capitalists, if they didn't, didn't take out these, didn't um, uh, lend to governments, would be using their resources in investment. They certainly would not be using their resources in consumption. So when the government borrows from capitalists and uses those to compensate people for paying uh, um, carbon tax, it's taking them from people who won't spend it 
to people and giving them to people who will spend it. So the spending gets done in the present. And that's why we get more consumption happening in the present. And correspondingly, later, when it repays the debt, it taxes future people who would have spent it and gives it back to the uh, capitalists. And that means it's preventing those future people from doing some consumption. So it's shifting consumption from the future back to the present, but not by borrowing from the future. That isn't the way that it happens. Um, and Ross suggested, well, couldn't we just do a pure redistribution? Well, actually, I thought that's what it was. I thought, think, thought that um, public borrowing is taxing the future and giving the tax to the people, taxing future people and giving the tax to the people in the present. There are other ways of doing it. One is to increase pensions. There are ways, other ways of shifting resources from future people back to present people. Increasing the rate of pensions is a way of doing it because uh, what it, the transaction of a pension is basically the young, the later generation, paying money to the old, the previous generation. So pensions are a transfer from a later generation to an earlier generation. And that is another way of transferring resources back. But I thought, I took it that loans are a way of doing this on, on a bigger scale um, and, and more easily. Um, then Ross asked, um, would this buyout be forced? Now that does raise an, an, uh, uh, an issue. And the, the idea is, no, it won't be forced. People will be fully compensated. So the no force is required. So it's, it's not as though um, there, is, there is somehow present people are being, the, the present owners of resources are being made to hand over their resources in exchange for receiving compensation. The compensation is supposed to be something that fully compensates them for reducing um, their production of uh, fossil fuels. That's the idea. Now, there is, a, there is a, a, a problem with this, though. So although it's what the, we have in the background, remember, an economic theory that tells us that this can be done. It tells us that future, present people can be fully compensated. And those present people are the, include the owners of fossil fuels, so they can be fully compensated. What it tells us is that they can be fully compensated at the true value of their resources. And as, it sta as they, the present markets in fossil fuels stand, the resources that these fossil fuel owners are overvalued. They're not valued at their true value. Their true value is less than it seems to be because most of these fossil fuels simply can't be used. The fossil fuel owners own vast quantities of resources, and we know that only about one fifth of those uh, resources can be used without destroying the very economy that gives them um, uh, value in the first place. The carbon budget that we have at the moment is maybe one fifth of what the known and owned fossil fuel resources are. But the market doesn't seem to have realized that yet. The market still values fossil fuel fossil fuel shares as though the resources that are owned by the fossil fuel companies are going to be burnt. And that means that they're overvalued. So I, I'm a necessary step on the way to uh, achieving this full compensation is to crash that market. The market is a bubble. People are overvaluing the shares. And I'm very much in favor of um, the... Uh, uh, of, of policies to of, of universities and institutions to give up their holdings of fossil fuels because they're uh, a bad investment. We should do that and we can hope to cross to crash the market. But um, uh, that is a necessary step that I didn't mention. Um, why not nationalize without compensation? Well, nationalization is a way of doing exactly what I'm thinking of because the government buys up the, the, the resources and then stops, stops using them. Um, so it's nationalization, but I'm thinking of compensated nationalization. Pablo talked about discounting. Um, uh, there's a difference between the discounting that appears in market rates and um, I think the sort that you were talking about. You were saying that we shouldn't discount future lives, which I certainly agree with. But um, the discounting of future commodities, which is what appears in the markets, is not, or it should not be, and need not be, um, a discounting of future lives. 
there's um, uh, what Ramsey was talking about was what we now call pure discounting, which is, dis which is discounting of future good things, such as lives. The discounting that appears in markets is the discounting of commodities. And commodities, future commodities, will have a lower value than present commodities if economic growth continues. Now, if it doesn't continue, then it won't be, won't be, this won't be true. But if it does continue, um, that means that future people are better off than present people. New commodities coming to people who are better off have less value than new commodities coming to people who are worse off. This is a, 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 a truth of economics that's been, that Alfred Marshall propagated in the 19th century. Goods coming to better off people have less value. And that means goods coming to future people. I mean, material goods, you know, things like bicycles and rice have less value than those things coming to present people. And that's why it is appropriate to discount those, but it doesn't involve discounting the future lives or future well-being. Um, Luis talked about how, how would we persuade present governments to put money in the climate bank? We don't. The, the, the present governments are not putting money in, they're taking money out. So that where the climate bank get, gets its resources from is borrowing from capitalists. It borrows from people. It doesn't borrow from governments. It, it's, it is borrowing on the behalf of governments from people and using the resources that people lend to it, handing them out to governments so they can use them on, um, on climate projects. Um, do I still have any time left or not? Probably not, I guess. Um, but perhaps I can come back and just um, just come back to the last thing that Sasha said. Maybe all the money can't do it. And this just gives me an opportunity to stress that the background of this whole talk was the economic theory that underlay it. And the economic theory tells us that we can, we can um, neutralize the externality of climate change in a way that requires no sacrifice from anybody. That's to say the economic theory tells us we can do it. Um, now, uh, I, I don't think that that's something that can be done just by relying on the market. So simply imposing a carbon tax is not in practice going to do it. It requires planning. So it does, I, I think there is, a, there is something to, there is a lot to be said for having this idea that we must achieve net zero by such and such a date and governments planning to do that because the market tends to act too slowly. So we need, we need that sort of um, uh, target setting, but um, uh, it, 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 the theory tells us we can do it. I mean, it doesn't tell us that we can't, um, <coughs> that, that, that climate change, when we've, when we've neutralized it, will have done no harm. Um, it, it will have uh, done harm, um, but uh, we can el 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 eliminate this um, externality, which is individuals doing harm to other people. That's what we can achieve. <laughs>